So this is a story from the Himalaya region. And this story starts off with a merchant's wife. And the merchant's wife, every day, religiously, she would light lamps. She would light lamps for the neighbours. She would light lamps for her, the children that she never had. She would light lamps for all the people in the world who were hungry. Every day she would light lamps. Every day she would light lamps. And she said to her husband, she said, Husband, husband, I would love to have a daughter in law that I could share my problems, my woes and my joys with. And the husband, the merchant, he scratched his head and he said, Wife, even I know this, that to have a daughter-in-law, you normally need to have a son. And she said, but I will light the lamps. I will light the lamps. We will have a son. And religiously, she lit those lamps every day. Now, one day, that merchant's wife was spinning with a spindle. Spinning with that spindle. And she felt an itch on her ankle. So she leant down and she started scratching and that itch got worse and she scratched a little bit more. And where that itch was on her ankle, a blister formed. And out of that blister <laughs> emerged a frog. And the little frog looked at the merchant's wife and said, Hello. And she said, Ah, oh, Mera Dadu, my frog, my beautiful frog. And that frog looked at her the way that a child would look at his mother with such adoring eyes. And from that day onwards, well, wherever she was working, the frog was hippity here, hoppity there, hippity here, hoppity there, like a small child does amongst his mother's legs. Well, as small children do, it grew into a bigger child. And that frog became an adult. And one day the merchant's wife said, Ah, oh, husband, husband, we have to find a wife. And the husband said, Oh, you're doing this again. Do even frogs have weddings? Do even frogs have marriages? She said, Yes, I want a wife. I want a wife, a beautiful wife for my son. So eventually he gave in and he sent to the priest, he said, go, go find a match, find a suitable match of equal status for my son, the frog. And off the priest went and he went to this town and that town and this town and that town and finally came to a place and he found a merchant and the merchant had a beautiful daughter and the wedding was arranged, but he said, this is the condition. This is the condition on the day of the wedding. Our boy, the bridegroom, he won't appear himself because he's otherwise occupied, but in his place, we will send a dagger, a knife. Which is what they used to do in those tribal areas. If the bridegroom was detained somewhere else, a knife would be sent because that was his honour, that was his name. And that was in his stead. And the wedding took place and it was a fine wedding. But of course when the wedding was over, the daughter-in-law had to come and see her husband for the first time. And she was so excited with the mendi, the henna on her hands, those beautiful intricate patterns all the way down her arm. And she was adorned like a beautiful bride and she went to her in-law's house. But when she looked, where was her husband? And she looked in this room and no husband and that room and no husband. This room, no husband. And she thought, well, maybe he's away on business. But several days passed and she realized that there was no husband. And her heart sank and she was very, very sad, grief stricken. But all the time this little frog was here, hopping here, hopping here, trying to catch her attention. Hopping around here, jumping here, trying to catch attention. Look at me, look at me, look at me. But of course, she just said, get out of the way. I want to see my husband. And her heart was sad. Now, every day, every day when her mother, her mother-in-law, sorry, used to go and bathe, she would take a towel, she would take her oil, she would take her soap, and she would say, child, when I'm gone, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not go into my lamp room. And she said this every day, and you know what it's like when somebody forbids you, the more they forbid you, the more you feel like doing it. So one day as her mother-in-law was bathing, she went into the lamp room, and she opened the first door, and then she opened the second door. And as she entered that dark room, there was a multitude of lamps with their lights flickering. And what did she see there? There, lying naked, with prayer beads in his hand, was the most beautiful man she had seen in her life. And as she looked there, there on a wooden peg was the frog skin. And she said, you, you've been deceiving me all this time. You've been right under my nose all the time. I'm going to burn that thing up. And he said, no, no, please don't. Don't burn that thing up. I am here because of the lighting of the lamps. Everything that has happened to me is because of ritual. If we are to get rid of that skin, ritual must be obeyed. When the merchant returns, tell him to hold a feast. Tell him to cook five different kinds of curry. Tell him that when the guests are ready, he's not to serve them. No servants to serve them. Call me and his son will serve them. And when his son serves all the guests, the whole of that village, then he says that skin will disappear of its own accord. And she agreed. And then she looked at him. She saw the shadows flickering on his body and she wished that was her fingers flickering, flickering, on, flickering on his body. She looked at his eyes glimmering in that candlelight, that, moon, that uh, lamplight, and she wished that she was staring into his eyes this close. 
and there was a silence for a few moments and she said well we've got a little bit of time haven't we and he said yes we have and he said, looked at her and she looked at him and they both at the same time said but you see but you see she replied and she rolled out a little carpet on the ground and straight away they started playing that ancient board game of luck and as they were there rolling the dice and looking at each other, anticipating each other's moves, so were they engrossed and focused on each other that, you know, sometimes she was on top. And sometimes he was on top. And by the end of their game playing, oh, they could taste the pachisi on their fingers. They could taste the pachisi on their lips. They could taste the pachisi on their skin, dripping out of their pores as she replatted her hair and just flipped off like this, just in time for the mother-in-law to come back. She goes, ah, child, you got a smile on your face. I haven't seen you smile since you came here. And she says, yes, Asoji, mother-in-law, I found a new hobby. <laughs> well, from that day onwards, as soon as the mother-in-law would go to bathe, they would go and they would play Pachisi till their heart's content. And then the merchant did return. And when the merchant returned, the daughter-in-law said, Papaji, Papaji, you have to do this. Please hold a feast. And he says, for what reason? She says, for your son. And he says, oh, the old woman, she's even got you thinking there's a son. She says, please, we have to do this. He says, for what reason? She says, well, for joy. And he said, very well. A feast for celebrating joy is, a, is a good, indeed a good feast. So they created a feast and every single person was invited in the village. And then the banana leaves were placed by their feet. And the merchant felt a bit foolish. He felt a bit silly. And she said, please call out his name. And he said, are you sure? He's a frog. Please call out his name. And he says, Putra Teleprone Aya. Nothing. Putra Teleprone Aya. She says, please say it properly. Say it with heart. And the third time he said, Putra Teleprone Aya. Everybody listened and suddenly the, heard the door unbolt from the inner door. And then the second door unbolt from the outer door. And as the door slowly swung open, there emerged the most beautiful man they had ever seen. The old women's eyes sparkled like they hadn't sparkled for many years. And he went up and he touched the feet of first the oldest members of the community and then his parents themselves. He hugged everyone else and then he took those bowls of food and he started serving them five different types of curry. And after they had eaten and after they had filled themselves and after they had all agreed it was the best feast ever, well he took some water and he washed the hands and the feet of his elders. And he was introduced to every single person in that village from the smallest child to the oldest grandmother. And they welcomed him in with open arms, welcomed him in as their own son. And the prayers had been answered, the prayers had been answered because the lamps had been lit with devotion and love and an open heart. And that couple, they had a good life. They had a happy life. They had a peaceful life. And you know what? They had more Pajisi than they knew what to do with. Jeez, it's a bit hard talking to a camera like that. <laughs>